Okay. I tamex kenatoni. Ik stoik kenatoni. 21 degrees below zero this morning, this moon day morning, the 4th of March 2024. Just checking my skunk traps out over here at the apartments. And as suspected, there's no activity. It's too cold. Hey, the small mammals got a hole up when it's 20 below. Can't be out running around. Hey, except for these small mammals. <laughs> Taylor and Lucy, we are on our way to the big dog park to run for an hour, hour and a half or so. Want to do five or six kilometers right away this morning. Got another couple of big dogs coming this afternoon. And this Lucy, Husky, might be going home. We'll see. Her, uh, her mama's not working or anything right now. She just wanted her to get out of the house and have some activity and stuff so she's with me for a night or two figured I'd get the camera rolling hey moppy uh, she says this other hey Kayla moppy rolling your window down as if she's gonna jump out the freaking window <laughs> she rolled it down herself, just stomping on the sidebar. You're crazy. Come on, settle down. Settle down. Save that energy for the dog park. We're on our way. So yeah, I figure I'll get the camera rolling. I uh, don't have a lot on the agenda today other than the dog stuff, so probably we'll go over to Botterill Bottom Park again and do some more exploring in preparation for next week's, or this weekend's, Sunday's uh, eco-tour. But yeah, and uh, you know, I probably got an update or two to offer. <laughs> Off on our moon day adventure, me and these doggies. Dometamex. <laughs> it's scunny. It's scunny, Tomex. Yeah, I found new motivation. It's on this stuffy kitawato. Just bark. Yeah, I found new motivation just in the last few days to continue my aggressive efforts at picking up more neat seat bulls. And you know, when Chris left, she also took with her, in a way, <laughs> the potential that we had to really get the household speaking fluent Blackfoot because she can understand Blackfoot fluently. Her parents just speak Nitsipoasin to her and so she understands it. She just doesn't practice speaking it but it wouldn't take much, you know. And so uh, that was a kind of a dream that I had, a project for us where I thought we can really contribute something to the community by being a model of a couple who are, you know, second language and fluent, because there are no examples of that right now, you know, and that's that's not good because we are in the last the last uh, generation of fluent speakers. So if people don't start taking up the responsibility, you know, to learn it. And it's hard because, you know, Ixiko, because the reason that most people in the world learn second, third languages and such is not for identity reasons. Um, 
or for cultural preservation or anything like that. The reason most people learn a language, the thing that motivates people to learn a language and the thing that, that motivated people here to learn English and uh, set Blackfoot aside is money. Hey, it's money. It's always money. Money is the economic, that money, the economy is the driver of language shift. Look around the world at language shift. Who's learning what languages and why? And it's almost all money. You know, there are certainly all kinds of indigenous language programs around the world, you know, that are trying to support um, the continuation of threatened languages and dying languages and such. Even pl places where they're trying to revitalize languages. But um, the fluency is not, it's not there and it's not coming out of these programs. And I don't think really that educational programs and schools and such ever lead to any kind of fluency. I mean, I don't know about you, but I took couple of years of Spanish in high school and then again in university and uh, I don't know jack of Spanish you know most kids here going through school take Blackfoot language every year of their lives in primary school but ain't none of them coming out with any kind of fluency so I think the way you get that fluency is by a really strong motivation to uh, to speak another language, and the strongest motivation, of course, is subsistence, is whether or not you're going to survive economically. And so, in a world that turns to the key of English, it is really hard to motivate anybody, even you know, people who are, whose whole lives are focused on the maintenance and revitalization and such of the, of the culture, um, languages are hard to learn unless you need them. So we'll see what kind of success that I have in the future with this, but I did find new motivation to continue trying, okay? And that motivation came in the form of being tagged on a Facebook post by Theodora Warrior. And the post was, uh, how do I say it? This, uh, Anatsiki Pitaki. Must have been her mom or her grandma. Anista uh, Ipi Soas. I asked Theodora what her name is. Uh, the old lady, Kipitaki. And Anista uh, Ipi Soas. And the link that was with this post was a link to one of my videos, one of my uh, lectures on the occasion when Abraham Maslow visited Siksika in 1938 and what came of that, hey? And that lecture has a big Blackfoot language component. It has a lot of history built into it. It's a really good um, talk. A lot of people have asked me to turn it into a book, but I like to leave it as a, a storytelling because it changes, you know, as, uh, as as years go by and I learn new things, I incorporate them and the whole, the story gets better and better, hey? But I guess Ma Kipitaki, um, that's some oak pretty often, hey? she's watching that video or stuff on my YouTube channel and when I hear things like that the elders are watching my videos and 
that they like them that uh, in this case you know it jogs a lot of memories and things for her and it's helping her you know in her in her uh, older age now it's helping her bring her back to different memories of different times in her life and such to uh, to hear the language or to watch some of the history that I talk about and these kind of things so that's a big motivation for me and um ipisoas sikta sitaki thank you for watching and um really helps me because i also have a lot of uh knowledge that I don't share here and like a lot of uh, origin story knowledge, place knowledge, you know, things like this. Um, knowledge about, you know, not the Wapi because I was so involved for so many years in repatriations and, and in ceremony. So um, I have a lot that I could be sharing here that I kind of hold back on a little bit because I don't want anybody feeling any kind of, you know, way about me or whatever, you know, this channel's not specifically directed as a Blackfoot cultural channel or anything. <laughs> so I stop. <laughs> um... This channel is my is my journal, and you know this isn't the first time that it's been reported to me, or that I've known, come to know, come to learn that there's an elder who's watching my channel regularly, and um, that they enjoy the content. There's not a lot of Blackfoot content out there on social media, by the way talk about giving shout outs and such um, for the language one of the best resources out there today is Sterling Crying Heads social media um, check him out on TikTok on YouTube, on Facebook and all of this, he's doing basically Blackfoot language lessons um, on all of those platforms and they're really good um, they're just you know, easy daily lesson. He'll take one concept or something and show you 10 different ways to use it. And um, yeah, shout out to Sterling for his content. It's really good. Helps me. But it's good for me to hear that uh, I'm being helpful to others too. So I'm going to keep it up and try to add more and more and Blackfoot content in this channel in general, um, but especially the language. Yeah, back home now, and check it out. There's a magpie couple who are building their nest for the year right here in my big elm tree in the front yard. So we're gonna have magpie babies here. It's gonna take them a month to build this nest. It's the most complicated nest of any bird in our region. It's gonna be a big orb with a clay bowl. And what I find interesting is that it's positioning here. I mean, obviously it's a good thing to be by my house because I like magpies and they have lots of food offerings. But also, this window, right up here, in this window, perches my magpie, Derek, my pet magpie. And talking about Kipitakiks, old ladies, um, I named Derek, or we named Derek, Mahoney and I, before we knew... Uh, we thought it was a, 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 a male, but it turns out after a few years living with us, Derek started laying eggs. <laughs> so Derek is a female. But for those of you who've watched my channel for a while, uh, you 
have known Derek all along probably, especially when I was living back in Riverstone and Derek was more active and such. Hey, mister. Oh, mister, just because I always have. So Derek sits up here in the window where we'll be able to see the magpie nest, you know, evolve over the summer here. And Derek happens to be turning 15 years old this summer. And in magpie years, that is super duper duper old. In fact, Derek may be the oldest living black-billed magpie ever. Um, I looked into it. What's the oldest living black-billed magpie on record? Because their lifespans, on average, are four to six years um, for this species. See you later, mister. Four to six years. So I wanted to know what's the oldest on record. Oldest on record was a magpie that was in captivity in Saskatchewan, the neighboring province. And that magpie lived to be nine and a half years old. Derek this year is turning 15. So Derek has lived three times the average lifespan of a member of his species and is getting close to doubling the record for the oldest living member of his species. So that's pretty cool. I gotta call Guinness Book of World's Record or wherever I gotta figure out where to call to, uh, to get it documented. But I've, I've got photos and film of Derek from the time he was an egg, <laughs> for real, to, uh, to now. So he's been, yeah, he's been around 15 years and that makes him um, something of a feat of nature, <laughs> which is cool. Hey, any case, um, I'm changing plans this morning. I think I was going to uh, go over to Bottle Bottom Park, like I was saying, do some more surveying in preparation for my eco tour uh, coming up on Sunday. But um, I think I'm going to shift gears and go instead to the Wilderness Park because it's such a calm, windless day. I want to take advantage of it. It's cold, but it's windless. And I was talking to my friend Tom, uh, maybe a week, week and a half ago, he was helping me fix my truck. Uh, it had a water pump issue. And I was telling him the story about me searching the coolies for um, Ellie the husky. Come on in, little girl. Are you frozen? This little girl gets frozen. Her legs can't deal with this kind of cold. Oh, my poor girl. My poor girl. <laughs> it's got to thaw out. Um, yeah, I was telling him the story of me trying to find Ellie in the coulee, and I, I mentioned that it would have maybe been a, a better success um, if I'd had a drone to use, you know, that I'd contacted a, a friend of mine who was a drone pilot and he, he couldn't make the time to do it for me. But if I'd had a drone, I would have used it. And Tom says, hey, <laughs> I have a drone that I don't use. Why don't you take it in and uh, use it for a while? So he's letting me take in and borrow his Phantom 3 drone. And uh, I want to start taking it around the coulee, following deer, following coyote, um, see if we can learn new stuff from that vantage point up above. And I have yet to try my own inaugural uh, flight of the drone, but today being it's how windless it is and everything seems like it would be a good opportunity. So I think that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna head over to the wilderness park after I eat a couple of eggs and uh, try flying this drone. Just 
getting to where I can see the river. We'll go to the drone launch site pretty soon. Just wanted to scout what's going on upstream here first. Obviously there's geese. The geese have been displaying their, starting to display their nesting territorial behavior. The magpies are building nests. The eagles should be sitting their nest by now. And maybe once I learn this drone, we can check that out. Golden eyes. These guys will be leaving pretty soon. And the eagle's nest. And I can't tell from this angle if anybody's home, but we got from above, we would know. An assortment of mallards and geese I just scared off. Lots of opspinics. White jaws, the Canada geese. There we are. I'm trying to see through my viewer here. So I'm thinking, just out here in this clearing, it's where I should try to launch. I'm a little. I'm a little chicken, to tell you the truth. I'm a little scared because, you know, it's an expensive borrow. It's an all-white drone in an all-white environment. <laughs> I, I'm hoping I do it right. I won't. I won't take a huge far away flight or anything today. I need to practice with it and get to know it. Uh, but I don't want to run it into any trees or anything either, so I'm going to get it high enough up that I can uh, make sure I'm not bumping into anything. I don't know. But we'll give it a whirl. Well, here's the drone. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to fly it today because I'm looking at the controller here and I just realized that I have brought the wrong wire to attach to my iPhone it needs to be one of these little sizes here and I brought a USB to my iPhone so I cannot hook up which means we cannot fly this drone today unfortunately and I was really uh, ready to go <laughs> scared but ready to go so I'm going to take it back apart, put it back in the backpack, and uh, continue my hike. Going to have to source one of those cords. Uh, maybe later today, maybe tomorrow or something. But for sure, at some point this week, we're going to test this drone out. Gee, that's a bummer. Oh, well. magpie was just calling over here and I think it was trying to alert me that there's food it's injured it's already injured this deer yeah hear this call this is a magpie telling a human whoops
This is a magpie telling a human there's food. There's food. Because it wants part of it. It's exactly what it's saying. This deer was right in here. But uh, there's something wrong with it. Let's see if we can find where it went. Where'd it go? That deer really did go over there. Kind of trust the magpie more than my own intuition. He's not calling though. Just gave a couple of calls and quieted. Huh. Yeah, I lost that deer. Some tracker I am. <laughs> Gimped up injured deer and I can't even follow him right. But, I figure the prairie wolves will eat good tonight. What was I going to do with it if I found it anyway? <laughs> Did want to have a better look, see what was going on. It might have already been attacked by the coyotes, but I doubt they would have left it injured like that and not finished it, you know? So... Who knows what's going on there? You know, I heard reports of a uh, black bear sighting Gyo along uh, along the 509, which is the highway going into the blood reserve. So, an animal like that could just continue downstream here to Lethbridge real easy. I don't know why there's a guy waking up, <clears throat> you know, the beginning of March. It was actually, I think, just in one of the last couple of days of February when I heard that. So, that would say something a little bit weird about the climate and such, but any case, I think I'm going to pack it up for today, go home, got those other dogs coming before too long, want to get there, get things settled, and uh, prepare for that, and then, I don't know, maybe tomorrow, Wednesday, we'll, we'll get back out here again with the drone and, and the right wire and try to give it an inaugural flight.